You know, I started this channel on theater history to make videos about topics that I really enjoy and find infinitely fascinating. I want to share with you just how much I love the history of theater. But I also want to use this platform to shed light on the way that we construct history, or more specifically, the parts of the past that we overlook or ignore when we put together a historical narrative about theater. You see, history is never fixed. It's not the past. History is the story we tell about the past, and it's the storyteller who decides what information from the past gets included in the story and how that information is woven together with other past events and individuals. And if you were to tell the story of American theater history, what would you include? What might you omit? Of the many events and individuals who contributed to theater in America's past, who and what would make it into your telling of that history? Well. I have several theater history textbooks, and only two of them provide more than a passing mention of one of the most important theater companies in American history, the African Company and the African Grove Theater. Before I go further, I want to acknowledge that there are a lot of conversations happening right now about black history and the teaching of American history. Lots of people have strong feelings regarding questions of racism in the construction of that history. These are hard conversations, to be sure. But let me take this moment to show you the physical evidence of how African Americans are, at best, marginalized in the history of American theater, or, at worst, completely erased from that story. And should you think that the African Grove Theater is not included in that history because, it, because its work wasn't very good or the people associated with it not very important, I would encourage you to keep watching because nothing could be further from the truth. The African Grove Theater and those artists associated with it shaped theater here in the United States and abroad for generations to come. So stick with me for a bit as we learn about the African company and how they shaped theater for black artists and audiences. The story of the African company and the African Grove Theater begins with its proprietor, William Brown. Brown was originally from the Caribbean and had spent much of his life as a ship steward in 1816, he settled in New York City where he rented a small house with a garden. During the 19th century, fashionable New Yorkers would spend their afternoons and evenings in what were known as pleasure gardens, privately owned and closed gardens where music and dramatic performances provided entertainment while patrons enjoyed a bevy of food and drinks. Think uh, mimosa brunch with a show. Brown's pleasure garden was named the African Grove and it was open to free black people in New York who, like their white counterparts, sought out leisurely activities, lighthearted entertainment, and stylish means of socialization. As a part of the entertainment for his patrons, Brown formed a theater company of all black actors to present Shakespeare and other popular plays of the time, calling his troupe the African Company, the first black theater company in the United States. But let's not forget the conditions surrounding Brown and the African Company. New York, as with the rest of the country, still recognized the enslavement of black individuals as a constitutional right, ensuring that African Americans would remain as part of an American underclass. Though the African Grove and its offerings predominantly targeted free black people, all around them was an ever-present and dangerous belief that white people, white society, was inherently superior. For example, an 1821 account from the National Advocate described the patrons of the African Grove in this way. These black fashionables saunter up and down the garden in all pride of liberty and unconscious of want. In their dress, salutations, familiar phrases, and compliments, their imitative faculties are best exhibited. Thus they run the rounds of fashion, ape their masters in everything. Utterly disgusting. Accounts like this, soaked in the racist perspectives of white supremacy, prove that it's not enough to say that William Brown established the first black theater company in the United States. No, there is greater context that must be provided. 
framing Brown's achievement through the lens of black life in, the early, in early 19th century America reveals the monumental significance of the African company in American theater history, a history that is certainly deserving of more space in our textbooks. Spaces for black people to enjoy themselves and interact with their neighbors without interference from white society were practically non-existent in antebellum America. But despite this, the African Grove provided an opportunity for black Americans to formulate a self-conception of themselves and their community through the act of performance. By performing their public agency to attend such events and in performing stories and characters publicly presented by black bodies and black voices. Such acts should not be considered lightly by historians. In an exploration into the varying degrees of oppression, enslavement, and prejudice against black people across the Americas, Patrick Reel states that the rare degree of uniformity that black northerners did achieve depended in large measure on the agency of blacks there, and that Throughout the diaspora, white oppressors' categorization of, Af of people of African descent also determined the fate of black identities. But black people themselves, in how they reacted to their situations, conditioned the emergence of black identities. William Brown's establishment of the African Grove as a black space for black performance was an effort in performing black identity. But it was also an act of resistance against attempts to define that identity by white society. Despite these challenges, actors in the African company did make names for themselves. James Hewlett emerged as the company's leading figure and a talented tragedian in his own right. Often identified as the first black American actor to play the role of Othello, Hewlett received an enthusiastic reception at his portrayal of the titular character in Shakespeare's Richard III, which was presented by Brown and the African company at an indoor venue in 1821 with seating for around 300 to 400 people, and located in what is now Greenwich Village. News of Hewlett's performance attracted black as well as white playgoers. William Brown, ever mindful of the dedicated audience members who he felt the African company represented, addressed the playbill to, to quote, the ladies and gentlemen of color, end quote. And he increased the number of seats available to black patrons. But that couldn't abate the ill intentions of many white audience members who, upon exiting the theater, were quick to raise a commotion, disturbing the peace of neighbors and even disrupting performances of other nearby theaters. Responding to the concerns of white neighbors and patrons, the police shut down the African company's production and their use of the theater was discontinued. And this proved an ongoing problem. During the three years that the African company performed indoors, they were rarely allowed to stay at any one theater for too long due to the hostility of many white theater goers and police alike. Nevertheless, the impact of the African company cannot be understated. Not long after their production of Richard III, the African company produced William Brown's original play entitled The Drama of King Shot Away in 1823. It was the first play written by an African-American playwright and presented the story of an Afro-Caribbean revolt against the British on St. Vincent in 1795. And it is with the African company that the greatest black Shakespearean actor of the 19th century received his first roles in 1822. At a time when most American actors were deemed subpar in their performing of Shakespeare by their English counterparts, Ira Aldridge would become the most celebrated black actor across all of Europe, especially for his portrayals of Othello. He was also the first black actor to appear at the Royal Coburg Theatre in London, in the role of Prince Oronoko of Africa in the Revolt of Suriname in 1825, only two years after the African company had permanently disbanded. William Brown and James Hewlett set the stage for the emergence of Ira Aldridge, and in turn, Aldridge dismantled many of the prejudiced and racist perspectives of white theater goers the world over. Unfortunately, the legacy of the African Grove and the African company is challenging to quantify because contemporary accounts of black performers their audiences and their venues were not only racist in their published perspectives, but also because the historical record reflects that racism in its many omissions. In The America Play, Susan Laurie Parks brilliantly captures the deliberate attempts to reduce or erase the lives of black individuals in her metaphor of the great whole of history. The historical record is littered with such holes, 
Between 1816 and 1823, accounts of the African Grove, the African Company, and the many individuals associated with it are few and far between, making it complicated to construct a strong narrative around the group and its history. Which leads us to where we are now, with a stack of theater history textbooks that largely skip over what was arguably the most important black theater company of 19th century America. And while those who wish to disrupt the work of the African company may have eventually succeeded in seeing it disbanded, their efforts to silence black performers and black theater will fail as long as historians seek to practice equity and justice by properly framing the treacherous mountain they had to climb just to practice their art. We owe them a more monumental place in our history of American theater. I'm Kyle A. Thomas, the theater history professor Thanks for watching, and don't forget that all of history is a stage, so be sure to find your light. I'm also excited to announce that my high school history teacher, Eddie Carson, helped me in the writing of this episode. If you want to learn more about Eddie and his work on anti-racism and history in the United States, you can check out more using one of the buttons, wherever it's going to be. I don't know. I haven't figured it out yet. Maybe it's here. Maybe it's here. I don't know. Right. Hey, like and subscribe too while you're at it. Thanks. <laughs>